Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elizabeth Shook. I'm the librarian for copyright and scholarly communications at Vanderbilt University in very hot Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> I've been freezing for like a week now up here. Um, anyway, uh, I uh, am going to talk about how much I am thankful for Sci-Hub solely because it's a conversation topic. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with Sci-Hub, but it is a pirate website that has an incredible amount of the copyrighted uh, academic publishing output that uh, the world creates. And um, it was created um, by a graduate student um, from Kazakhstan, Alexandra Albakayan. Um, and she got sick of, you know, needing to write papers but not being able to access stuff. It's the same story we hear all the time, and she did something about it. Um, I want you to know I understand that Sci-Hub is illegal, I understand that she's a pirate, and I understand that there is evidence of her doing uh, phishing schemes and other kind of nefarious um, ways of uh, getting these papers, and this is not in any way an endorsement of Sci-Hub. This is solely something that I use to get people's attention, um, because I've realized um, as many of you have probably realized, when I go out and talk about open access, it's kind of a boring topic now. Students have heard about it. Their professors generally are against it. And I get this look that's like, oh god, this again. You know? And I think um, I, I've been struggling to find the right message that will really communicate to students now, especially at a, um, a private institution like Vanderbilt, which really doesn't have that large of, of a money problem. We're really lucky. We have access to a lot of stuff. Um, so that's the problem. I, I just feel like I lose people when I talk about open access. Uh, and, and the thing is, like, Nobody's gonna really come up to me and be like, oh yeah, we shouldn't open up research for people because open access is stupid and people don't deserve research. Like when I explain to you that I want everything to be open so the world can innovate, nobody's gonna really like argue with that necessarily. But the problem is students and faculty, they can't concentrate on what's good necessarily, right? So I really feel like it's the librarian versus the professor. I'm sure uh, many of the librarians in the room can like feel this one. It, it really, um, I'm telling their students to do something completely different than they're generally telling them. So tenure calls. I mean, we saw Aaron's presentation yesterday where 5% of PNT uh, documents mention open access, and it's mostly in a negative light. We know that uh, <laughs> they're not really listening to us. I've had several postdocs tell me, yeah, I get it. I know stuff needs to be open, but I also need a job. <laughs> so I'm not going to publish open access. I am not going to be the one to interrupt the system because I need to make a living. It's totally fair, right? How do you argue with that? Um, Beals List residue is still around. I still get tons of questions about Beals List. I don't know if that's true across the board, but it seems like my predecessors kind of hammered the predatory publishing thing home and um, trying to break that cycle. Um, and then just an overall low opinion of open access. I was giving a talk literally called Open Access and Digital Humanities, and one of the professors before I got up was like, don't publish open access, you'll never get a job, to all of the students. And then I went on, so it was fun. <laughs> yeah. But I think that this is a pivotal moment, and, and not to get political or anything, uh, God forbid, but I think that um, what I've noticed with students at Vanderbilt at least is they're becoming more active in political movements and really trying to answer um, to, the, to the inequity that they see across the board. And I think that Skullcom has like this, or open access has like a, a place to kind of slip in and be like, hey, this is one of the large inequities 
Um, so I think that uh, the message is resonating now more than ever with students. Um, and what they hear, number one, the cost of materials. I, for one, am strapped with student loan debt, and I know it's only getting worse from here on out. So cost of materials is, is a crazy large thing, right? Privilege, though. They realize they're privileged. The students at Vanderbilt, for the most part, realize that they, they are incredibly lucky. And they pay attention to the inequity in other institutions. Even in Nashville, we have um, a historically black college. And the, the, the inequity there um, between the materials that we can afford and what uh, Tennessee State can afford, completely different, right? And they see that. We're in the middle of Nashville, which is in a, a moment of gentrification, and it, it, it all seems to come together. And then also this culture of instant, which I'm totally guilty of. Like, I want my stuff and I want it now. I think, you know, nobody wants to wait around for an interlibrary loan for three days. Or, you know, um, even, I mean, many of us know that some of the highest users of Sci-Hub are in the United States and, and North America in general. Um, clearly, Sci-Hub, even though it's not a search engine, is doing something right. And it, I think that it has something to do with this culture of instant. So these are the messages that the students, at least that I'm talking to, um, seem to really uh, pick up on. And so enter Alexandra, because she gets everyone's attention. And I just sort of noticed through trial and error, like bringing up Sci-Hub, maybe asking students if they've used Sci-Hub, but they're always like, yes, maybe. Uh, <laughs> But it gets people's attention, right? Because they do kind of, um, they do know that it is actually a bad thing. I mean, they were, they, they may not have been around for Napster and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer music sharing, but they get it. They know that it's wrong. Um, it's not necessarily blocked on Vanderbilt's campus, Sci-Hub, uh, but it's kind of hard to get to. Um, so the, this message resonates, is what I'm saying. So when I talk about Alexandra Albakayan and her plight with, you know, trying to write a dissertation and needing to know not only the papers that she needed at $35 to $50 a pop, but the papers that she didn't. Like, we all need to skim papers to know, like, oh, that's, that is not relevant. Um, but uh, when I start this conversation, I always start with, okay, everybody loves a rebel and everybody loves an underdog. And you know, like the French Revolution is really interesting for a reason, but um, Elba Kayan doesn't believe in uh, copyright law. She thinks we should abolish it. Uh, again, we're not quite sure how all of this is being populated. We all have guesses. And um, she shut off access in Russia, uh, I think, was it about six months ago, a year ago? It's kind of um, a big deal because she got to decide a whole country didn't need access. So I start with, OK, this is a pirate website. And I want you to know that even though I'm pushing you to publish openly, I do that because I respect your copyright. And I respect your right to hold on to what's yours. And she doesn't necessarily do that. So whenever you have this conversation with students, I think that's an important thing to point out because I often get questions like, well, if I'm publishing open access, everybody can just plagiarize me, right? And it's like, well, that's not, that's not how it works. Let's start with like copyright 101 and then like go from there. But I don't have that much time. Um, and then I say, I want, I want all authors to get the credit. Everybody in every piece of the pipeline needs to get credit for this. And that really resonates with them because they're usually working with uh, faculty and, and other students to get some publications out. Yeah, they want everybody to get credit. And I think that's kind of plants the seed of like, oh yeah, I can get all of these papers for free instantly pretty much, but uh, what if somebody could get my paper? You know, it, it kind of spurs that thought. Um, so how are the papers gathered? I always ask them, um, so at Vanderbilt, we have our VU net IDs. Um, and should I give you my VU net ID? You could see 
not only all the papers in the library that I have access to via our subscriptions, but you could see my pay slips and my social security number. And the list goes on and on. You could get access to uh, my benefits. So if these um, credentials are being shared, it's not just papers that she has access to. And again, not to get political, but we've seen what um, you know, uh, sharing information can do <laughs> uh, with the election. So it, it's pretty scary. And of course, we all know there are evidence of phishing schemes. I think she's tried to quietly say that she's not doing it, but we don't know. Um, and so this is, an, is another piece of the argument that really resonates because data and privacy has become such a large piece of the news recently, um, especially w with the Facebook thing. All of this kind of culminates into them understanding like, oh, maybe I, sh I wouldn't want to give that away, you know? Even though I may be fostering a public good in their opinion, right? Um, the, the thing that uh, really hits home for me, uh, and I think that the students pick up on, I have quite a bit of um, anger about this, is so uh, Elba Kayan is kind of uh, reviled in, in Russia, even. And um, they named uh, some uh, Russian uh, researcher named a parasite after her. <laughs> So, and that's that's the name of it. I'm not even gonna try. Um, but then I guess that was kind of the last straw for her, and she cut off access to Russia. She has later restored access. But I find that really, really smarmy for all of the uh, talk that she has about busting open copyright law, abolish the publishers, blah, 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 then she gets to decide that an entire country doesn't have access? Yeah, it's her product, but that's insane to me. I just, I can't even comprehend. And I think that this piece particularly um, goes back to the students understanding that privilege is a thing and, you know, the whim of one person can cut off your access. Okay, I'm doing all right. Um, so all this to say, I encourage you to talk about Sci-Hub with um, your students, your faculty, whomever, because it is a really engaging topic. I like thinking about it all the time, actually. Um, and, and I always try to you know, hit home with these specific points that I've pulled out, but then I, I pose questions to the audience. Um, we all know that academic publishing is kind of crazy, and um, there isn't an equitable solution right now, but we're working on it. What would an equitable solution look like to you? I get a lot of really crazy answers, um, but I get a lot of really great answers, and I think that um, having students consider, sit down and consider what they would view as um, an open future is really important to their future career, right? Because they're going, these are our future faculty. Um, and what do you think the future of Skullcom looks like? Kind of the same idea. Um, of course, I don't say Skullcom to them because they'd be like, I don't, know what that is. Um, but uh, I, I always ask them, like, how do you view academic publishing in the future? What would you do? And it's always instant. It's always, you know, doesn't take the months and months and months that we've all talked about and rehashed and all that. Um, again, it, it, it has been like a really interesting, every time I bring up Sci-Hub in an open access session or a copyright session, anything like that, it just fosters an incredible amount of conversation. So uh, in conclusion, I want to thank Sci-Hub for <laughs> being a li uh, really controversial, but um, it, you know, all that to say like, it's generating a lot of conversation more than any other conversation starter I've found to do that. So uh, again, not an endorsement of Sci-Hub. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. But anyway, thank you, Sci-Hub, and thank you. <laughs>
questions? Any questions. Oh. Uh, yes, it's more more of a comment than a question. Uh, just I'd like, uh, as we have people from all around, I, I, I do that also. Uh, I do bring SciHub in a lot of open access conversations. And uh, I, I get the feeling that reactions in Brazil are quite different. I mean, I, I, I have oh, not really? feel, I have not seen Pretty much anybody guilty. I mean, like everybody. Yeah, we use it. Like the most I got is like, oh, yeah, I feel kind of guilty, but I still use it. But, but mm -hmm. I, I think our endorsement is like uh, close to 100% in the Brazilian scientific community. And uh, so, and, and direction to open access is actually something very particular to North America. I mean. Uh, when you bring up open access, like commercial open access, people's reactions that we don't do it because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the tenure track uh, craziness is a little bit less, but like cost is a real issue for uh, for like uh, developing countries. So I mean, uh, I, I bring up the same debates. I get very different answers, so I get that that has an international difference to it. Yeah, that, that you know that's really interesting, and I hadn't considered that. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I represent a faculty department that a lot of times I get forwarded emails from researchers from like countries in Europe or South America and basically say, hi, I'm a researcher. I saw your paper on PubMed. Can you please send me a PDF? And most of the time we do send the PDFs because that's, you know, that's part of the open, openness of what we do. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, sometimes do you think that that's uh, a phishing scheme in a sense, or should we be asking more from the researchers, like an ORCID ID or something, to make sure that we're not supplying them a PDF that we shouldn't be supplying them a PDF? I think that's a really interesting question that I hadn't um, considered, but I think my answer to that would always, I think I would always give if someone asked, um, because I would rather they do that than, for instance, go to Sci-Hub, but you're right, then your paper, you have no control of it after you send it. So um, perhaps we should be a little more, but then, then, you know, are we any better than the publishers trying to lock stuff down, you know? Um, th so I, I guess in, in my head, I would always just send it. <laughs> Hey, Daniel Himmelstein here. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, so maybe a little bit of a controversial thing, but you said that, or alluded to, that Sci-Hub usage was wrong. Uh, but I could make an argument that if subscription publishing is wrong, uh, then the right course of action is to use Sci-Hub, such that subscription publishing goes away as quickly as possible. Uh, so while definitely under copyright law, you know, Sci-Hub violates it, uh, ethically, you know, isn't there a strong argument that it's doing something good for science? To that, I will tell you that I am a librarian for copyright law, and I enjoy paychecks. <laughs> so, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Anybody want to respond to that? In addition. <laughs> Say that again, Katrina. How many people here don't use Sci-Hub? <laughs> <laughs> I'll hide. <laughs> <laughs> How many people use Sci-Hub? Okay. Very interesting. You have a question. Hmm? Okay. I, oh, oh, all of it, I hope. <laughs> Uh, just a quick comment, uh, and as I said, I'm an open access advocate, went to grad school with Mike Eisen, but the quick comment from my perspective on SciHub, I want everything to be open access. One thing that I think SciHub doesn't deliver us is that the people who really don't have access, the patients, the teachers, people who are Googling, they don't know that SciHub exists, right? And Absolutely. Uh, the results, Sci-Hub does not come up in Google searches, right? The domain constantly changes. You need to know that it exists. You need to know that you can go to Wikipedia and find 
the URL that will work, and that's not the solution for those who really care about the taxpayers, about the patients getting access. That is not, from my perspective, that's not the solution to the bigger thing we're trying to solve. I heard a here, here, <laughs> over here. Um, so other questions, comments? All right, so I think lunch is next, is that right? Woo yeah, come back at 12.45. Oh, and come back at 12.45. So <laughs> thank you, let's uh, give a round of applause. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.